Hello. Before you start this episode of The Game Changers, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about our new documentary, Abby Ward, A Bump in the Road, which explores the challenges faced by professional female athletes and all working mothers. It follows the remarkable journey of an England rugby player as she battles back to the professional game just 17 weeks after the birth of her baby and then on to secure her place in England's Six Nations squad for 2024. The documentary is free to watch in the UK on ITVX or globally on Rugby Pass TV. And don't forget that our other documentary, Game On! The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, is still available to watch on Netflix in the UK. Now it's time for the Game Changers. Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from extraordinary trailblazing women in sport. I'm your host, Sue Anstis, and I'd like to start by thanking Barclays for their ongoing support of The Game Changers. There are few brands across the world who are doing more for women's sport right now. Barclays is a title sponsor of the Women's Super League and they also back the FA in the fantastic work it does to ensure that every schoolgirl across the country will have the chance to play football by 2024. I'm really excited to introduce my guest today, Dr Pippa Grange. Pippa is an influential sports psychologist and a culture coach working across elite sports and business internationally. She believes relationships are at the heart of everything and the antidote to fear. As head of people and team development at the Football Association, Pippa worked closely with the England team for the World Cup in 2018. And although she's very humble in accepting any praise, her presence was clearly transformational in changing the culture of the team and helping the players to build their confidence. Pippa is now part of a senior leadership team for the global Right to Dream group, working on cultural strategy. Pippa's worked across the world in a range of sports, from swimming and rugby through to Australian rules football and soccer. She's also the author of an extraordinary book that I loved, Fear Less, How to Win at Life Without Losing Yourself. I had heard that Pippa had faced some real challenges growing up, so I asked her to tell me about life at home. Well, I grew up in Yorkshire, in a place called Harrogate in North Yorkshire. And um, my early childhood was awesome, amazing. You know, had a a really close, loving relationship with my mum and my nan, especially. Uh, Mum was a single mum when she had me. She was 19. You know, I remember that very fondly. She got married when I was five, subsequently had three brothers and sisters, that sort of it. so early years up to being 12 or so were were really nice like a regular English childhood and you know um, I look back fondly but things disintegrated my stepfather was um, an alcoholic and their marriage disintegrated and it was really a struggle she was a single mom with four kids you know n- no resources working all the time I was a kind of a pseudo parent from the age of 12 for my siblings <laughs> Well, I look back now and I had really a, a, a whole heap of responsibility that a, a teenager wouldn't normally have. Um, and she got into a subsequent relationship later, probably she would reflect, I think, when she was, you know, already uh, overwhelmed and um, at the end of a tether. And she got into a relationship which was violent and that unraveled everything for us. So you know, through that sort of period in the lead up to me being 16, she was, you know, in this violent relationship and he lived in the home with us and sort of any person who's grown up with violence in the home and where there's been alcoholism and, um, you know, the the layers of trauma that that lays down for a young person. And, and in fact, for the mum, <laughs> the parent, you know, it's very complex stuff but what you feel as a teenager is angry and abandoned and confused and you know I think what happened for me at that point was I just became fierce and bold but in a way that was about rejecting the status quo and being sort of determined to forge my own path and I was I was sort of generally annoyed with life, <laughs> you know, and it served as a, a reasonable motivator 
for survival at that point of time. But, you know, I've learned subsequently that that's not the best place to, to place that sort of energy. It was a mess. And I left home at 16, couch surfed for a bit, was sort of officially homeless for a little bit. And, um, and I thought, well, this isn't going to work out. So I always had some kind of push in me, some sort of really resistance to getting stuck, I think, which, you know, maybe that came from the kind of childhood I'd had. Found a bed sit eventually and I had, um, you know, five jobs, wow. <laughs> one full-time and four part-time jobs that were kind of went from 6 a.m. till midnight. Just, I think, with a determination that this wasn't going to be the way it was, even though I had no idea of direction, something in me always was called back to the education. I'm a, I'm a real natural learner. I am curious as a human being. And I was pulled back to education and I went to college in York no idea what I wanted to do, but I'd gone and done a BTEC in leisure or something, which yeah. was probably about the easiest option for me in front of me at that point in time. And I, I didn't have a sense of myself or whether I was really capable or intelligent at much. I just felt this sort of fire of emotion in me and, and determination to move. But at, in that course, I met a brilliant teacher who was a really interesting woman. And she convinced me over the course of a couple of years that I was smart and that I could definitely go to university. And that was a radical idea for me. It's like, what? You know, as if nobody in my family had ever been to university and it just wasn't anything I'd thought about. Um, But I got excited by it. She helped me apply to various universities and Loughborough accepted me. And it was like, you know, the world had opened up. I thought that I thought I'd arrived at that point. (laughs) Then I started that journey at Loughborough University where, uh, you know, you're living in residences and I was completely immersed in different kinds of people than I'd ever met um, with different views about how life might work out. And, you know, while I was still pretty lost and confused in some ways, I really found some anchors. I found basketball, which I played there. I found study, which I really enjoyed. And I found a, a bunch of mates that, you know, were were and still are anchors for me through that journey. And I guess I started to grow up about that that time. But, you know, long journey from there to fully growing up, I think. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? And I guess to get to university from, uh, as you say, that kind of B-take approach and, into, and somewhere like Loughborough. I'm obviously mm. a graduate myself, so a massive fan of. I should ask you, what hall are you in, actually? What hall were you in? Um, Evelyn Richards. Oh yeah, I was a Faraday girl. Were you? <laughs> but that's amazing. That and I guess that transition then and into sport. So how did you end up then from actually? What did you study at Loughborough? And then how did you end up? I guess moving on into getting out to Australia. What was that that yeah. process? Um, I studied uh, sports science, which I had no idea what it was when I went, um, but it sounded really interesting. Sports science and social science with an emphasis on the psychology. So I did a joint honours. Um, And, you know, that was, I think, back to that now, given that I had no idea, really, that the step into that was pretty (laughs) over optimistic for me. Unfortunately, you know, it was I was well suited to it. But, uh, you know, I really like that blend of the the sports science and the social science, because I've always been interested in what sport does for us and who we are while we're in it. So it really worked nicely. And that was my first taste of sports psychology, too. So I did that. I I graduated and did the obligatory um, year travel. And I was going with a girlfriend who I played basketball with and uh, she couldn't go because her her father was retrenched. And so she had to pull out. And so I had this choice. Am I going on my own or am I not going? And so I went on my own. But that was really formative to travel on your own and be terrified half the time and really find a, a different view of the world in other places as well. So When I came back, I ended up working in a basketball, netball, volleyball centre that was a a commercial venture up in uh, Reddish near Stockport that a a basketball friend had had put me in touch with, the opportunity there. And, you know, uh, I was the the person who was charged with filling the centre with people. So it's kind of like a, you know, a sport development role, programme role, first first gig after traveling and and it was fun and um, it was an Australian company and after about a year there was an opportunity to go and do the same thing in, in Adelaide in Australia with a new center that was opening and I was like yes please 
So that's how I ended up in Australia. And then, you know, one year led to another and another, and then I, I built a life there and, uh, yeah. you know, picked up some more study and, um, and sort of found my way into sports psychology and the, the doctoral studies uh, eventually in Melbourne. So, yeah, that was my entry point to Australia. Excellent. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that, that first role of working with, with football players in, in Aussie rules. Mm. Um, I guess Australian men from the outset, especially Aussie rules players, not well known for uh, talking about feelings and perhaps showing vulnerable <laughs> sides. Uh, so how do you even begin to, to change the culture of a sport that's perhaps founded almost on that hyper, slightly unhealthy, but hyper masculinity? So what was the, your process in, in working in that environment? Yeah, I mean, there was sort of a couple of threads to it. What, the first job I had in football was the um, uh, with the AFL Players Association. So it was kind of the organisation that was known as the support structure for players and for their off-field life, uh, for the conditions of their employment, but also for their off-field life. So, you know, we tackled things like depression, um, drug policy and what people understood about addiction. We tackled things like well-being in the sport and transitions and, and that kind of thing. So it was a great position to stand in front of a group of Aussie rules players and talk because it was something that was about their future, their well-being, what was advantageous for them. So I think it was easy because I was players association. Yeah. But, you know, you would walk into a room of 40 something guys with arms folded looking at you like, what is she talking about <laughs> many times? But I think I had conviction about what I, I was talking about. And the other thing I know for sure, working with many, many young male athletes over time is that the way they are in the room talking one on one is very different to the way they are in the group and, and the locker room, as they say. So. I always found that when they got through the door and you had a very human trusting conversation with them, that they didn't bring bravado and machismo and all the rest. They, they, you know, they wanted to talk about stuff. They might not show that publicly. That took much longer to break down some of those um, hyper-masculine stereotypes. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, especially around mental health, that people are hurting. So we use the angle often of, what would you want this to be for your mate who's sitting next to you? If you don't feel comfortable talking about it yourself, can you talk about it for him? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. And so that because there's a very strong sort of sense of mateship and, you know, teamship among Australian teams, I think probably true of all teams. So, so, you know, that was the angle in, um, and actually I, you know, with the exception of a few rules, I was, all, I always felt quite well, respected and regarded in those environments with the players I've had my experiences with the institutions and you know the um, organizations that have been more ostracizing or lonelier as a woman but generally the machismo among the players I've you know they're young they're young people with really solid intentions most of the time and, and not necessarily the tools to communicate so once you get under that and you stay confident, I think it, I think it gives them an opportunity to be who they actually are. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, I know when we say the name Dr. Pippa Grange, many people think of you as the person that came in and transformed the attitude of the England football team and helped them to eventually win, win that penalty shootouts. But you didn't kind of bite their hands off at the the offer of a role or the first approach. So can you tell us a, a little bit about that and and why that was really? Hmm. Well, I was in LA at the time, you know, as I built my own business, I worked with sports clients and business clients. And one of my business clients had asked me to come in, work internally in their organization for a couple of years, which ended up being three years to help them build people and culture work, um, you know, bring the psychology to the people and culture work, which was, which was fun. And I ended up in LA doing that. So I was kind of in that and I was starting to get a bit itchy about, well, what's next, you know, um, and missing that, you know, it's deeply intensive in sort of corporate life and business is different spot. And I was thinking, mm, I, do, I do miss it a bit. But at the same time, I felt quite relieved to be out of it for a minute because it's sports intense too. And I had a call from Dave Slemon, uh, Elite Performance Partners, saying, you know, we have a client who's interested in a psychologist. We didn't say the client, but work with a very high name, uh, a big name brand, you know, um, to change culture and to work on the psychology. And, and I said to him at the time, 
I'm not really interested in a hands-on psych job, you know, pitch side, pool side anymore. I felt like I'd done that um, kind of thing. And it's, it's a particular lifestyle, you know, to be on camps or at games all the time. And I, I kind of felt like I wasn't, that's not where I was. But I kept talking to him and, you know, as, as we got further and further and he sort of, you know, we were at a position where he could tell me who the client was. And I, he told me, you know, it, the FA in England and my immediate impression was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> you know, that sounds awful because it had such a terrible external reputation. Yeah. But actually, the more you explored internally, there'd been some really great work done by people like Dan Ashworth and um, Dave Reddin and a number of others around around the place, Matt Crocker, that had done good work on restructuring and revisioning what, what it could look like. And they had a really strong understanding about the missing piece in, in culture and people. So, you know, I, I kind of got swayed into it. And then I came to the assessment centre, which was felt like it was about four, four weeks long. <laughs> it was two, <laughs> two days long and very intense. But I just had fun with it. And I met Gareth, the coach, and, you know, when I started the role, the idea was that I would run the department, not be personally within a team. But it was no, end of November 2017 by the time I started because I was relocating and we just didn't have time to bring somebody else in before prep camp for World Cup. So, so I wasn't ever supposed to be that oh, psych. Right. Um, I was supposed to be running the department with that psych working with me. So I stepped stepped into the breach, so to speak. And I think because because Gareth's open-minded, because so much good work had already been done. Owen Eastwood had been in there doing some fantastic work on identity and Lane Four had been in there doing some sort of foundational work. You know, so it was ripe really to make some decent shifts and go much deeper on, on sort of, you know, what are the conditions for winning? Not how do you take a penalty kick? Actually, that's the smallest slice of the work but what are the conditions required for eight weeks on the road to be winning, you know, and to keep everybody in a state where they could win, you know, that was the work. And I look back at that now and, uh, you know, the external world imagines this kind of guru out the front doing some kind of mind, mind trickery to help somebody take penalties. It's the tiniest piece, but I did a lot of work with the coach and the, the staff group and I did a lot of work to keep the conditions possible for the way it transpired and to bring different energies into camp. So, you know, I, I felt really weird at the end of that because the media had made a hero out of me, which is a difficult thing to experience within an elite sport anyway, because tall poppies don't go well. Mm -hmm. And I was new. And I, I felt really awkward about that. And I, I think it did create some tension. I never said a word through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I tried to get you on the podcast, I think, yeah. at the time, and that, it was like, there's a definite no from the FA from yeah. you. But there was a definite no from the FA, but there was an, a no from me too. Yeah. I still felt very new in the environment, very rookie, and I felt like I'd had a window and it had gone really well. But I knew I hadn't created all of that, but the story that the media wants is a hero. Yeah. yeah. So I became it, and it was it was a bit weird, actually, and uh, I felt very reluctant, but I also felt really rewarded that we'd been able to have some conversations that had never been had yeah. and uh, tackle some subjects about who we were and what that badge meant that hadn't been had for a long time or that had been contemporized <laughs> and they really needed to be contemporized for the young people who are in that team now. So the work was enjoyable with the team and then, you know, after the World Cup, I was still with the team because we still hadn't found that right person to come in and running the department across 16 teams across men's and women's. And I had, yeah. a, you know, at one point there was, I think there was 11 psychs or culture wow. coaches working with us, which was, was really awesome for a period of time. And then there was a restructure and it became, you know, the agenda shifted a bit to be much more performance focused, less culture focused and an amalgamation of departments that that sort of brought it more into data evidence, traditional sort of pitch psych and, you know, well-being and less away from that thing that I feel like over 25 years I've been developing as niche mm. around, you know, redefining and um, success and winning and attitudes about winning and mental freedom. So I, I kind of felt 
okay, I don't want to go further up this ladder. This is, I, I respect what they're doing and I've really, I really felt fortunate to have that opportunity, but my ladder's maybe up a different wall. Yeah. So, so yeah, I took, I took my leave at that point and jumped over to write to dream. And when you look back now, do you feel that that culture you help create has been retained? It's obviously harder to see that externally, but do you feel the the teams and people department doesn't exist anymore and things yeah. have changed, but what do you feel? Um, you're right. It's too hard to to sort of comment on it from outside. I'm, I'm still, you know, regularly in touch with the people who are in there. There's some brilliant people working in that at St George's Park and I have the greatest respect for them but I think that the focus has changed a bit away from that work but I hope that some of it's retained and you know things have their own momentum so it's it's taken its own personality and evolved its own way in good ways and some of the same people are there so a lot of the same people are there so I'm sure there's rich stuff that emerged while I was there with those people that that still retain. So it's not something I did that was a blueprint. That's the way. Yeah, you know, things have their own legs um, and they they grow their own way. But you know, it's part of being a catalyst or a spark for a way of seeing things. Maybe. Excellent. You've written this incredible book, Fearless, How to Win at Life Without Losing Yourself. And I genuinely feel it might have changed my life at 55. (laughs) I bought so many copies for friends and for my daughters and family and things as well. So uh, you open with a really strong statement. uh, What if I told you your life was run by fear? So can you talk to us, I guess, without giving away the whole book, but a little bit around about that premise? Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you. I'm really pleased it's it's meant something to you. Um, that was the whole point of writing it. I think that we underestimate the role that fear plays in our lives, in our psychology. You know, there are, I, I, I sort of distinguish types of fear. I talk about in the moment fear, um, which, you know, we're all familiar with that shows up and gives us a, a adrenaline prickle down the knees and you know, in the back of the neck kind of thing that we we, we all experience one way or another on a, a, a an occasional or regular basis. That's one thing. But I think that there is another kind of fear that has become so culturally enmeshed in our psychology, and that's the fear of not being good enough. And I think that's pervasive in all of our lives on a very regular basis. So we have this fear is very natural. It would don't want to be without it. What we need to do is make sure that the amount, the dose, it, you know, is right. It's not, it's not a poisonous dose um, to our psychology. So um, hence fear less, not fearless. So, you know, I, I think it does run all of our lives. It's, it's there and prevalent and needed, but it's culturally high volume in lots of our institutions, our environments, our relationships, our sense of ourself. I describe it in the book as as being a bit sneaky. You know, it doesn't always show up and be really immediately visible as fear. It might show up as envy or jealousy. It might show up as perfectionism and the need to control. It might show up as a preference to stay small and separate and not be revealed. You know, so there's, there's lots of different sort of twists and turns it takes. And I think when we look at how we experience ourselves in life and you see it from that angle, fear is really prevalent. And my objective isn't to help people get rid of it or just soothe it and quieten it and, it, you know, turn away, is to actually really understand how it's showing up in your life and what it's costing you, what each fear journey is costing you, and then what you might do to think about replacing it with something that's more, that's stronger or more hopeful for you. And and that process that was there a moment in time when you realized the impact that fear can have on lives or is that something that you've accrued over your time of working with teams and sports and so on yeah kind of kind of a bit like the the sort of you know the, the thing I was saying before about the there is no silver bullet template or understanding or moment um there are things that uh, show up for you that really illuminate what you kind of know in your gut mm. um but for me it was accumulation of examples over many years and <clears throat> when i was in australia maybe about 10 years ago a bit longer now i started to notice that the people i was working with whether they were sort of boardroom or change room they had the same patterning of fear of not being good enough even those people who were you or I would look in and go that's a massively successful winner 
but the experience of their success still was colored by that fear of not being good enough. And, and, you know, I I started to realize that it was actually stealing everybody's joy in sport or, or in winning. So it's a, it's a pattern that accrued over a long time for me. And I thought "Mm, that's maybe the thing to work on. (laughs) I'm fascinated by so many of your methods and you kind of give some fantastic examples throughout the book. And one I was really intrigued with is that Triple H exercise. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it was first devised in Atlanta Falcons NFL. I think it was Mike Smith and John Gordon who'd, who'd sort of devised this or tried this out. And the idea of it is how do you play for your team if you don't know your team, right? And it's the idea of intimacy, which you know, we, we've kind of made intimacy far too narrow in our understanding as just something that happens between, you know, partners or lovers or deep friends, right? But intimacy is basically, it just means showing up as you, authentically as you without the mask on and being vulnerable enough to do that. And it's a big deal. And I personally feel, and they felt that if you can bring intimacy into a team and people can actually know each other at some level, you are going to really have so much more opportunity to have the kind of bond that works on the pitch. So Triple H is standing up in front of the group and telling a story of a hero, a highlight and a hardship from your own life. And in Richmond Tigers that I talk about in the book, you know, it can be, uh, they tell all sorts, it leaves the imagination to the individual. You say, what you, you know, if you told me you're three, they're, they're going to be very different to the next person. Um, so it's very personal. You know, I've seen people who are the bravest, toughest individuals out in the field and who would be bold enough to say what they thought about anything, you know, in a social setting. But talking about themselves and those three H's was took them into such a vulnerable zone. And they'd sort of, you know, rather poke their eye out than, than stand in front of other people and, and talk. Um, but even though they were terrified, I didn't do it. Shane McCurry did it, who, who um, came after me as a dear friend. He came after me at, at Richmond Tigers. But, you know, the, the train of that thinking around intimacy and bringing that into the team has sort of had a long, a long tail. And when they stood up and told those stories, they were horrified and terrified for weeks beforehand. But absolutely every time, you know, 40 other people in the room would go and give them a hug and just say, we love you afterwards and feel respect and endearment and notice the person's courage in being vulnerable, which for me is just such a massive underrated bridge to performance. So it really shifts things. I think when you can bring that kind of intimacy into a team, most times we don't, we're way too performative. We're way too, uh, we manage the impression we make very tightly. And is that something that you then take into the business environment too? 100%. That works? Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The the ability to have real conversations mm-hmm. rather than carefully craft your words to get a result, which is means you're always in performance, is always theatre, you know, and you never actually get to that stuff that is the real performance unlock, whether that's bond, team, alignment, unlocking somebody's creativity or or willingness to take the risks to solve a problem in a different way, you know, that it, it needs intimacy, mm. it needs intimacy and some kind of safety. You know, uh, Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety is brilliant around that. But, you know, I, I think she doesn't use the word, but I think when she's explaining it, she's also talking about the ability to freely express who you are. And for yeah. me, when you do that with another person, you and I are doing it right now, right? That's intimacy. Yeah. It's so powerful, isn't it? And does that come, I guess you need to get the players on board to share that, but clearly on a hierarchical basis, it's about getting the buy-in from that, it's the structure of a senior management and team. And is where does where does the blockage occur for you when you go into an environment to create that? Everywhere. <laughs> Everybody's always terrified of it. You know, they might think it's a great idea, but, you know, um, in organize, if I give an example of an organization that I've worked with doing something similar, you know, um, I always ask the boss to go first, mm. you know. Um, so, you know, that person showing up without their power armor on, even if they're much loved and well liked and don't think that they use power in a negative way, 
the idea of being the boss and the performance of go that goes with being the boss is really hard for them to take the armor off and say, you know, I want to tell you about my grandma or I want to tell you about when I really had a hard time. Yeah. But it unlocks something huge, but I start at the top and ask the boss first. And so then that gives a, a natural permission and an encouragement, you know, but it really needs some strong facilitation to do it well. And then the and the emotional energy that comes through it, even if you're in the kind of hypermasculine environment that you talked about before, where there's a lot of closed, closed body posture and, and eyes down kind of thing. I absolutely know that they're going to put their arm around somebody in the corridor yeah. afterwards or say, that was brave, mate. I wouldn't have done that or, or whatever it is, you know, that it, it, it starts a momentum of energy towards something much more useful absolutely fascinating isn't it um you've been in sport for so much of your working life and it's uh that discipline that is so focused on outcomes so results and the scoreboard and and it's easy to see how athletes put so much of their worth into the results that they create so how do you begin to to break down that for them and create that that change in in what sport's about for them I think that it's an exploration it's not that I bring it a new way of looking at it what I try and do is create the conditions for them to look at what feels right you know because again it's not my template it's not my idea it's just it's what I've tried to do with the book too it's like how can I provoke your thought about what actually feels right for you or better stronger for you and what is the cost of your journey if you're doing it differently in a way that you don't want to so so I think you know I try and create conditions to discuss or to explore or to play plays massively underrated or to connect, you know, and, and sometimes it's really subtle. It's not just like, okay, there's going to be a big scary meeting, everybody in a (laughs) circle and we're going to have to reveal ourselves and talk about our mothers. You know, it's like, it's too terrifying. So you can do it much more subtly than that. Triple H is a really great example, but as I said, there'd been a big run up to that. It wasn't like day one. <laughs> you know, Everybody in. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like I, I'd be <laughs> horrified doing that. So I, I think you have to just continually think about what conditions and environments and culture am I creating? Are we creating on the daily that is um, helping people be freer mentally, psychologically? Because that's the stuff. And is there a different approach for different sports? So you've worked across, uh, you know, Aussie rules and rugby league and swimming and so on, and also with different genders. Is there, do you find it different working with female teams to, to male teams? Um, I, th- I think if you ask about individuals, female athletes versus male athletes, I see quite a lot of difference in emotional tone, perhaps, or men sometimes feeling that they have to be more performative and, and kind of reluctant when it comes to uh, sharing emotions. But um, in teams, female teams too often, in my view, share the norms of that sort of performative, keep it all in, you know, talk about it when we're out of sight, don't say what you really feel and mean because you don't want to be seen as weak or less or less committed or whatever else. So mm. I still find that there's still quite a single archetype of how to be in a team you know and that's something I'd really love to see change over the the coming years that there can be more individuality and emotional freedom for people in teams it doesn't have to look a certain way you know I think we're a bit stuck in a template of how it looks and you've talked about a huge amount of the work that you've done in the past but you exposed bullying culture at Australian so I'm in back in 2012, and that's certainly something we've been hearing more about recently in sports like gymnastics and athletics and then some para sports in the GB, GB team too. We talk about the, that kind of myth that fear is the best motivator, which is certainly something that we see in sport. So how do you feel coaches can get the most from their athletes without that you know, need to intimidate them or the belief that they need to intimidate them? Yeah, great question. It is a myth, isn't it? It's a sticky one. I mean, if you if you think about the premise of the book, fear is always with us. We don't need to add more. You will bring <laughs> your own if you are the performer, right? It's it's actually more about channeling it in a useful way. I think what happens is that the coach feels fear 
and transmits it, passes it on because that sort of need to feel like all the edges are tucked in and everything's going to be controlled. And, and you know, they, they need to push that person towards their goal is just a an underestimation or a, a, a I've used the term lazy before, and that's probably not quite right. It's a, a underexplored way of doing it. So fear will lift your game for the next 15 minutes, let's say, because of effort. But actually, there's so much cost, uh, psychological and physiological cost of mm -hmm. elevated fear. It just it just doesn't work as the motivator, you know. Everything from narrowed vision, from changed physiology, from a dump of cortisol, which is going to have an effect half an hour after that, to, you know, the anxiety and the, and the um, track running in the back of your mind about don't mess up, yeah. which is this bucket of attention that you have to apply to the task in front of you, whether it's a penalty kick or, you know, um, the next phase of a game or whatever else. Um, the bucket of attention you have to apply is narrowed because half of it's spent on don't stuff up. And also the experience is awful. <laughs> so it, what you're what somebody is trying to do when they do that is make sure that the person's focused, make sure that a person is bringing right effort, that they are applying their talent to the task. There are different ways of doing that that are about discipline, which is very relevant and focus and attention and confidence. Fear does not lift confidence. It takes it in the opposite direction. So I think, yes, we've got many examples of somebody getting a, as they say in Australia, a halftime spray from the coach and it, and it resulting in something. But most of the time that's out of effort and then momentum. The momentum of the game might shift or change. And it's, you know, we see that as, as the way, but there's a lot of luck in that. I think the more precise or skilled way of doing that is driving attention, discipline and confidence. So it's, I just find it very limited as a ledger of cost benefit. It usually doesn't stack up and it feels rubbish. I, feel, I, feel, <clears throat> I guess there's so much fascinating in the book, but I did find that the physiological effect of fear and the decision making and all those <clears throat> elements was quite extraordinary to read and understand about that. So do you think sports and coaches are, are beginning to understand that? Are things changing in attitudes? Books like yours obviously will help that and, and spread the word, but do you feel we're in a more positive place in terms of the way we coach athletes? I think there's some amazing progress happening in that, um, you know, and like any other sort of big psychological shift, it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of courage to keep experimenting. But I see some very cool things that, you know, inspire me or lift me, especially where women are coaching that are different and that willingness to step in and say, I don't really work like that. So why would other human beings work like that? That's why in the book I talk about see, face, replace. So like you have to really stop a bit longer and see what's going on for you and see where fear is kicking around in the corners. And uh, actually, yeah, I am a bit, you know, that is anxiety speaking in me. That is a fear of not being good enough. And then what's it costing? And then, you know, bringing that into the room. So uh, it's a male example, but Steve Kerr as um, you know, Golden State Warriors, I really love his coaching methodology and, and philosophy because, you know, their values include joy <laughs> and compassion too. You know, I think that he really coaches the human being, not just the tactics or the game. And if we really think about how human beings operate, then this stuff is it's a journey. Like, how do we grow? How do we open up? How do we step into a bit more vulnerability for performance? It's not an either or proposition. I think people think if I'm vulnerable, I'm going to do all the soft stuff. I'm going to lose focus on the win. You know, my sort of central message is no, that it's about method. The win is there for the taking. It will still involve blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. It will still involve all the grit and all the work, but the tone is what we need to change and fear is in the tone. Excellent, excellent. Well, so much of your work has been undoing years of athletes focused on results and judging their sense of worth by their achievements in a pitch or uh, in a pool. But with Right to Dream, it seems you're helping athletes to shape their sport in a very different way, right from the start, from the outset. So 
I'd love you to tell me a little bit more about Right to Dream and your your work with the organisation too. Yeah, I mean, I think the sort of central part of the model for Right to Dream is that there is a, a the triangle of learning or development is football development, educational or academic development and character um, which as a young person matures into sort of a, a, a pro player, that becomes purpose, character and purpose. You know, how do you want the things that you know about yourself, your own identity to drive how you act in the world and especially how you act in the world for others? You know, life outside your own window. So the model from 10 years old, when a, a kid joins one of our academies, especially our residential academies, which at the moment is in Ghana and will soon be in Egypt, is that that triangle is the basis of the learning. I don't want to over romanticize it because they're, they're also young people who are aspiring to pro football yeah. and they will move into a, a, or um, very sort of uh, high uh, high end education in the US or the UK, you know, so it, it, they enter what we, you know, inverted commas call elite environments where, where there is masses of this kind of structure and orientation to outcome. So we have to prepare them for that as well. But, you know, so those aspects of resilience and discipline and self belief and self focus, all those things really matter. But we hope that we also give them a rounded sense of who they are as a human being. Um, and, you know, they live in a, a multiverse, as we say, not just a, a single universe of I am only a success if I play pro football for 10 years. You know, how else do you bring richness and success into your life for you and for others? How are you part of the world outside of performance? So that's kind of a, a, a big piece of it. And we're expanding at the moment and trying to take that sort of redefined idea of excellence to other places for people to experiment and explore with as well what's your role with right to dream i'm chief culture officer so in another organization that's just you know it's on the executive excellent excellent as we've alluded to many perceptions of leadership are associated with more traditionally male attributes such as authority and and dominance and yet we're seeing amazing women like Jacinda Ardern in a very different way leading with compassion and respect and that authentic uh, area that we talked about earlier so what advice would you give to to women who are taking on leadership roles now around the attributes that that they adopt Mm. Um, I mean, Jacinda Ardern is a, a great example because for me, she is a, it's about what is her and. She has got swathes of authority. If you think about what she got done in her first term with the first terrorist attack on New Zealand soil and COVID and, you know, achieved massive things with influence and authority. She didn't just show up with compassion, right? She had those other things. Dominance, I think, is the one that we can kick to the curb, that, you know, ideas of dominance and comparison are the, are the draining, exhausting, not very useful things that are part of leadership that we have to conquer and dominate the other. Yeah. But I think that a Jacinda Ardern or, you know, we might look at closer to home and Emma Hayes as a coach as well. Yeah. I mean, she's got authority. She's got credibility. I would do what she told me. And it's not just because she shows up with charisma and compassion. It's an and yeah. It's what you add from that original classic kind of outdated archetype. How do you bring those other things? You know, but I think that or orientation for any leader is if you start by thinking about what am I trying to achieve and who am I trying to achieve it with and for and go back to the human, the human perspective and think what moves the human. And most of the time it is not going to be those hardcore things about dominance and comparison they're short-lived like fear like like the idea of you know a fearful halftime talk it's um leadership attributes that are deep resilience persistence compassion open-mindedness like can i hear my leader learning can i hear my leader listening can I see flex in them? When we think about, sometimes I think when we talk about resilience as a leadership factor, we're still thinking about toughness. Can they bounce back? Right? It's just one aspect. When I think resilience, I'm thinking the difference between toughness, which is like a concrete block, immovable, no flex, and a flexible sheet of steel, which is resilience. Like, can it bend and come back? Can it take a different shape? 
if the environment or the context needs it, you know, or is it rigid, hard, tough, immovable, no give in it. I think they're the things for contemporary leadership that are just really high value. It's fascinating. It is. And, and I guess just finally, clearly you've had amazing success career-wise and the book's had huge success too, but what's next in terms of your personal ambitions for the future? I would like to, I've spent sort of 25 years in sport and, I, and you know, the reality is that the majority of my emphasis has been working in male teams. And I would like to have a broader conversation. I would like to see how we can curate and create a different archetype for women working in sport, but also for men who might embrace more of the feminine <laughs> and, you know, get rid of some of that old sort of stuck tough archetype that we've just been talking about. So that's important to me. And I'd really like us to broaden out and be a bit more imaginative about this idea of winning and success and what that looks like. So, you know, there's parts of that that um, I hope to be able to do through the role with Right to Dream, but there's also parts of it that are being able to contribute a little bit to a broader conversation about who we are and, and how we live. Wow, what an incredible woman. It's clear to see why Pip has had such an enormous impact across her life. I loved hearing about Pippa's link to Loughborough University. Other trailblazing guests on this podcast who studied or lectured there include football legend Jill Scott, British Paralympic champion Baroness Tanny Gray Thompson, head of women's football at the FA, Dame Sue Campbell, and the CEO of the Youth Sport Trust, Ali Oliver. If you'd like to know more about the other work I do, including the Women's Sport Collective, a network for all women working in sport, please visit fearlesswomen.co.uk. This is also where you can find out more about all my incredible guests from this and the previous series, and you can also listen to the podcast from the website too. You can also sign up to Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter that highlights all the latest developments in the world of women's sport. Thanks again to Barclays for their kind support of the Game Changers, to Sam Walker, our executive producer, Rory Ouskery on sound production, and Kate Hannon behind the scenes making sure everything runs smoothly. Next week, in the final episode of this series, I'm so excited to talk to Laura Woods recently voted the SJA Sports Presenter of the Year, Laura is a regular on Sky Sports and the host of Talk Sports' flagship Sports Breakfast, one of the most listened to shows in the UK. Laura talks very openly about her journey from being a runner at Sky Sports in 2009, working her way up through the broadcasting ladder in production before moving in front of the camera. Laura's outgoing nature and her unflappable personality make her one of the most in-demand sports presenters right now. It's like walking down a a road with a load of potholes and sometimes you can skip over them and sometimes they completely suck you up. I find the kind of get back in the kitchen comments, I I find those, they annoy me a little bit, but then sometimes I'm kind of like, well, that's such an old joke. And if you haven't come up with anything new for the last however many years, I feel sorry for you. If your opinion of a woman is genuinely that she needs to stay in the kitchen, you haven't evolved either. Like, what are you doing, you know? The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. Sport.